Okay, welcome to Word Without Walls. Welcome to the Saturday summer service. The title of the message today is Finishing the Work. And I think it's important we talk about this because even though the work is finished, there still always seems like there has to be something for us to do. We have to have a part in this. And, and we do, and I think it's important that we look at it and we see what our part is. Because God made the way of grace to get to us. We didn't, he, he, see, the problem was never us getting to God because really we didn't want to get to God. We wanted to get away from God because we thought he was mad at us. But see, it was God's heart that he needed to get to us. So he made the way of grace so that he could come to us, not so that we could get to him. And then once he made that way, our response is, our response to the way of grace is the walk of faith. And here's the spoiler alert, that's how we finish the work. We don't do anything except believe that it's finished. And we're going to get into a lot of this stuff, but first I wanted to kind of really uh, clarify what the work is that Jesus finished. And, and it's a lot to preach, there's a lot of it there, but for, for today what I want to focus on, it starts in John chapter 19 verse 30. And... It says in the King James Version, When Jesus, therefore, had received the vinegar, which is wine, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. And that's where we get this term for when we talk about the finished work. We talk about the fact that when Jesus was on the cross, right before he died, he said, It is finished. So whatever he came to do at that point was finished. And, and kind of one of the keys here is that after Jesus died, he did a lot more stuff. He took six steps to get to the throne, and the second one was him dying. So he still had more things to do after that. But what we're looking at here is what he finished right as he died, right when he gave up the ghost, right after he drank the wine on the cross. And in order to find out exactly what he was talking about here when he said it is finished in this case, in this instance, we have to go to Luke chapter 22, verse 18. And Jesus says, For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. This is what he told the disciples at the Last Supper. He said, I want you to eat the bread. I want you to drink the wine. I want you to partake of me, but I'm not going to do it until the kingdom comes. And this is, kind of a, this is kind of a verse that goes along with Jesus also saying, There are some of you here that will not taste death until the kingdom comes. See, Jesus was prophesying, but what he was prophesying about was the cross. He wasn't prophesying about someday out in our future. He was prophesying about a couple of days in his future. Everything Jesus talked about was himself and what he was going to do on the cross. And that's why it's so important that we see in John 19 that after he drank from the vine again, he said, it is finished. He said, I'm not going to drink of the vine until the kingdom comes. And then on the cross, he drank from the vine. He said, it is finished. And what happened, what he finished was the kingdom came. That's what he was talking about right here. He said, it is finished. I've done everything I need to do. Now the kingdom is here. Now the kingdom has arrived. The kingdom's not in your future anymore. It's your present reality. It's where you live right now. He made the, the, the kingdom or Graceland or the promised land or whatever, you know, whatever terms we use for it. And the Bible uses a lot of terms for it. He made it available to us right now. And he made it available because he took out every qualification. He took out everything that we needed to do and he did it. But the key here is that he didn't just do it for us. He did it as us. So in the same way that Jesus finished the work, you finished the work. Because when he, when he said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto myself, talking about the cross, talking about the way he would die. When he drew you into him, everything he did counts as you doing it. So see, not only did Jesus finish the work, but you finished the work. Now all of the obligations that he took care of, you took care of. And that's why the Bible talks about, uh, in regards to Abraham, that his faith was counted to him for righteousness. Abraham's righteousness didn't mean anything. Abraham's actions didn't mean anything. The demands that were placed on Abraham didn't mean anything. What mattered was Abraham's faith. And again, that's how we respond to the way of grace that God made to get to us. We respond to it through the walk of faith. 
and that's what we're going to look at today. We're going to be extensively in Hebrews today because sometimes I like to jump around and make connections with things, but other times the Lord directs me to, to really just dig in and, and, and show a, a bigger chunk of Scripture and kind of unravel some things in there. So we're going to look at Hebrews chapter 3 and chapter 4 and a little bit in Hebrews 12 today. But, but again, I wanted to set this all up by saying the, the finished work that we're talking about it's, it's the kingdom. It's being able to enter the promised land. Because, as we're going to see in, in our passage in Hebrews, the people of Israel, a whole generation of them, were disqualified from entering into the promised land. They were disqualified from entering into rest, as, as Hebrews calls it. But, because Jesus came and he said, Come to me, you who are tired and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Because Jesus came and not only gives us rest, but because he is our rest, now we can see that, that, that we can enter into the kingdom. We can live where we're at. We don't have to get anywhere. We don't have to jump through any hoops. We don't have to, really, we don't have to finish the work, so to speak, even though that's what it always feels like. All we have to do, as we're going to see, is we're, all we have to do is believe that Jesus finished it. Believe that the cross was enough. Believe that when he said it is finished, he meant it is finished. And, and again, what he meant by saying it is finished, what he meant was the kingdom is here. The kingdom is now. The kingdom is you. And again, that's where we stand today. We're not just in the kingdom. We don't just live out of the kingdom. We are the kingdom. And, and, and really, the, the way that I understand this the best is the kingdom is the, the realm where the king rules and reigns. And that's what I am. I'm the realm where Jesus rules and reigns. He's the head and I'm the body, and the body follows the head. The head leads the body, and, and that's exactly what it means when, when we talk about, you know, those who are led by the Holy Spirit, those are the sons of God. That's what we're talking about. We're not just the king because the king's in us, but we're the kingdom because the king lives in us. Wherever Jesus is, that's where the kingdom is, because again, he's not only the king, but he, he literally is the kingdom. Wherever Jesus is, that's where rest is, because he doesn't just give us rest, but he is our rest. So what we're looking at here is, is we're looking at, again, we're, we're trying to understand who Jesus is so we can understand who we are. We can stop trying to do something that's already done. We can stop fighting a battle that's already been won, and we can just simply learn to be who we are and, and just live where we are. And, and really, again, instead of instead of trying to get to the kingdom to realize that we are the kingdom. So let's look at Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 3, starting with verse 14, in the King James it reads, For we are made partakers of Christ, if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast until the end. If we believe that Christ is in us and we are in Christ, that's what makes it true. Because really, it's already true no matter what. But if you believe it, that's what makes what's true, true for you. And that's what he's saying here. He's saying, if we keep this confidence steadfast from the beginning to the end, which again, Jesus said, I am the beginning and the end. If we keep it Jesus all the way, if we keep our sights on him, if we keep our focus on him, if we stop trying to get somewhere and just start looking at where we already are, that's how we are made partakers of this. Because again, I can give you a gift, but unless you open it up and take it out and start enjoying it, you're not partaking of it. You're not receiving it. And this whole Christian life is about figuring out who we are, where we are, why we're here, what we've been given, what it means, who God really is instead of who we've always thought he was. And again, we find all of these answers in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus came to show us the Father. Jesus came to shine his light and reveal things as they really are. He changed everything that needed to be changed on the cross. Nothing else needs to be changed. We just need to see it the way it really is. And I think that's a key here because if we're trying to be, be history makers and, and world changers, then again, we're missing out on living the life that Jesus came to give us. We're missing out on the gift of eternal life. Gifts are not supposed to be, you know, used in, in, in order to change things. Gifts are just supposed to be enjoyed. And that's what Jesus gave us. He gave us the ability to enjoy our lives. Not to suffer through however many years we get and then hope to get to heaven someday, but to realize that we're in heaven right now and just enjoy it. Just enjoy living. Just enjoy the ride wherever God wants to take us. 
And how we do that, how we're made partakers of Christ, is by holding our confidence steadfast, by believing it, by not doubting it, by saying, listen, I am who the Bible says I am. Daddy loves me because he is love. Not because of anything I've done, but because of who he is. When we start to see things clearly, then it makes it so much easier to, to believe things the right way. But if we have this idea of God where he's still waiting for us to finish the work, if, if he says, yeah, you can rest, but first you've got to do all this stuff, then we're never going to get to that place where we can rest. And that's why in Psalm 23 it says, the shepherd makes us lie down in green pastures. He says, stop working so hard because I already did it all. And you already did it all too because you were in me when I did it. There's no more work to do. And, and you know, again, I'm not saying we don't do anything. But what I'm saying is, even if we never did anything ever again, the work is finished. The kingdom is here. The kingdom is now. The kingdom is us. And again, you know, there, there, there's another place in the Bible where it says, we're not saved by good works, but we're saved unto good works. And I understand all of that, and I'm not going against all of that. But what I'm saying is, it's not until you're in rest that you can truly do any good works that God really would want you to do anyway. If you're working hard to get to rest, you've got it backwards. But if you're resting, God in you and through you will be able to come out of you. And again, that's the key because it, if, if all good gifts, all good and perfect gifts come from the Father of Lights, then it's got to be Him in us if we want anything good to come out of us. And that's the key. We can't be good to get Him. We can only be good because He got us. And, and that's what we see here. It's not about doing, it's about believing. We're not human doings, we're human beings. And we're just supposed to be who we are. And that's what rest is all about. It's about stop trying to change and just really start looking at Jesus so you can see what you have been changed into. It does, the, the Bible does not say, as he is, so will we be if we try really, really hard. It says, as he is, so are we in this world. Jesus made us exactly like he is by bringing us into himself and putting himself in us. He took away the separation. He took away any differences. He took away everything that, that was holding us back from, from, from what God has always wanted, which is a relationship with his creation. That's the only thing God has ever wanted. He's always loved you, and, and, and his heart's cry has always been, I want you to know that I love you. I want you to receive my love, because when you receive it, when you get so full of it, it's going to flow out of you naturally, and that's where the good works come from. The good works come from being uh, moved with compassion and motivated by love. But again, we can't have any of those things. We can't give any of those things unless we first receive them from the Father. So again, we're looking at how are we made partakers of Christ? How, how do we make what's true, true for us? How do we be where we are and how do we be who we are? And, and the simple answer, again, is through faith, through believing it. If we believe Jesus did the work, we'll stop trying to do it. Because if you believe the work is done, listen, if, if I mow my grass and I believe that I've mowed it, I'm going to stop mowing it because the work is done. I don't need to keep doing it. It is finished. And then I can say, then somebody can ask me, how come you're not mowing the grass? And I can say, because it's done. I don't need to do it. Now I can rest. Now I can kick back and, and you know, watch a ball game or, or whatever. Now I can enjoy it. But see, again, this isn't about hurry up and finish the work. This is about 2,000 years ago on the cross, Jesus mowed the grass. Jesus mowed it once so it never has to be mowed again. Jesus brought the kingdom to existence, and it's an ever-expanding kingdom. And it's not, the only place it's going is bigger and better. It's not going away. And that's what we have to understand is that it's not up to us whether the kingdom's here or not. It's up to Jesus. And he did it. He drank the wine again after saying, I'm not going to drink this wine until the kingdom comes. That's what happened, and that's what's true. And, and now we're looking at our part, the walk of faith, how we make it true for us. So it says in verse 15 of Hebrews 3, While it is said, Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts, as in the provocation. So again, believing comes down to a heart condition. It's not so much about what you know in your brain, it's about what you know in your heart. It's about God's heart beating in your chest so that everything he says is true has somewhere to land inside of you. God speaks spirit to spirit and he speaks holy to holy. So unless, your, unless his spirit is in you, unless you know you're holy because he's holy, he can talk all day but you won't hear it. 
That's why the Holy Spirit or, or our love receptor is so vitally important for us to truly understand why He gave it to us and what it does. And what it does is it allows us to take God at His word. It allows us to, to be able to shrug our shoulders and say, Okay, God, if you say you love me, I'm just going to believe it. I'm just going to let you love me based on who you are and not based on who I am. I'm going to be able to say just, just, just the exact same way that when Jesus was baptized, before he did any miracles, before he did any ministry, before he did any work, when he got baptized and, and the Holy Spirit rested upon him, that's when God said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Because without the Holy Spirit, you can't hear that. You cannot accept that. Without the Holy Spirit, you, someone can tell you God loves you and you'll say, Yeah, right, God loves me. Look what a dirtbag I am. Look at all the mistakes I've made. How could God possibly love me? But then when the Holy Spirit comes in, then you can start to see that it's not about me. God's love towards me is not about me. It's about Him. God does not love. God is love. There's nothing else He can do. Love isn't something that God does sometimes. It is literally His very being. So, so here's what I'm saying. If it's not love, it's not God. So if you're looking at God in a way that does not represent true, unselfish, uh, lay down your life for your friend's love, you're looking at God the wrong way. And if you're looking at Him the wrong way, you're looking at yourself the wrong way. Because how do we see Jesus? We see Him in the mirror. We get an unveiled face. We take the law or human effort or the flesh out of the way, we look in the mirror and that's where we see Jesus and that's how we're changed from glory to glory into the same image that we see. Again, understanding that, that it, it, we don't need more changing, we need more revealing of what we've been changed into. But a hard heart will not allow that to happen. A hard heart will say, no way, I am who I am. I do what I do and, and only if I do good will I be accepted. But again, that's, that's, that's Adam's heart, not Jesus' heart. That's, that's how we think in, in, in the natural, so to speak, rather than with the Holy Spirit. That's why the Holy Spirit is so important, because it circumcises the flesh from the hard heart and reveals a fleshly heart that beats with love. So it goes on in verse 16 and says, For some, when they had heard, did provoke, howbeit not all that came out of Egypt by Moses. But with whom was he grieved, with, with whom was God grieved forty years? Was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? And again, you know, in, in, in my personal quote-unquote theology, sin equals unbelief. The problem God had with, with, with the original people of Israel is that they didn't, they, they didn't believe him. They never believed that he was who he was and he was going to do what he said he was going to do. They tried to do it their own way and they murmured and complained and they got mad at Moses and all these different things. And God said, listen, if you don't believe, you can't come into the promised land. Because again, who is the promised land? Jesus. If you don't believe in God, you cannot come into God. If you don't believe in Jesus, you cannot be a partaker of him. So it's so important that we believe correctly. So that's why, uh, that's what we're talking about here. All of those who died in the wilderness short of the promised land. So in verse 18 it says, And to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that believed not. So the, the, the writer of Hebrews here, he's literally equating the promised land, which, which these natural people of Israel were not allowed to enter into, with rest. First he's talking about the promised land, and then he says, That's who God said will not enter into my rest. So, so what we see here is, is rest is the promised land. The promised land is not a piece of real estate over in, in, in Israel somewhere or over in, in, you know, in, in the Middle East somewhere. The promised land is rest. The promised land is a person named Jesus. That's what we're really, truly, honestly talking about here. We're not talking about, you know, the grass is greener on the other side. I wish I lived here or I wish I lived there. What we're talking about is entering into Jesus. Entering into rest. And then in verse 19 it says, So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. Which again is kind of my key verse today because if you can't enter in because of unbelief, that means the only way you can enter in is through believing. So again, how do we quote unquote finish the work? What's our part? What is the walk of faith? It's simply believing. It's just believing that the work is finished. Believing that God put the kingdom in me so I don't have to go anywhere to get into the kingdom. I just have to believe that it's me. I just have to believe that Jesus did what he did, and I have to believe that I am who he says I am. So let's look at this in the Message Bible, and then we'll go to the next chapter.
Hebrews 3, starting with verse 12 in the Message Bible says, So watch your steps, friends. Make sure there's no evil unbelief. And I like that where he says evil unbelief, because again, I think, you know, to me, unbelief equals sin. So if we're talking about any evil, if we're talking about any wickedness, if we're talking about any, uh, you know, spirit of Antichrist or sin or, or, or whatever we want to say, I think it's evil unbelief. I think that's the only thing we ever need to be on guard for. I think every other enemy has been defeated. And really, I think unbelief has been defeated too because we saw last Saturday that repentance comes from the Lord. He gave it to us. He said, I'm giving you something to believe in. I'm giving you the ability to believe in it. You don't have to muster up faith on your own. You have been given the measure of faith. And again, I preached this a couple of weeks ago, but the only thing our faith needs to do is get us to Jesus. And then His faith takes over, and we live our lives in the flesh through the faith of the Son of God, not faith in the Son of God. Faith in the Son of God brings us to life, and then faith, the faith of the Son of God sustains us through life. His life in us is our life. So again, when, when, when we're talking about making sure there's no evil unbelief, Jesus made the way for that to be possible. Jesus took out our carnal minds and gave us the mind of Christ. He said, if I think for you, there's not going to be any unbelief. If, I, if my spirit is telling you the truth, if you're listening to the voice of truth, then you have something to believe in. So again, it's not even us trying really hard to believe. That's, that's, that's works and labor. That's religion. That's, you know, I, I have to do more myself. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about Jesus providing us with rest. Jesus providing us with everything we need. Jesus saying, you don't even have to believe this thing on your own because I gave you something to believe in. I showed you how to believe. I, I am your faith. So it goes on and says, uh, make sure there's no evil unbelief lying around that will trip you up and throw you off course, diverting you from the living God. So, so real, quick, a real, real quick aside, it does not say here, make sure there's no sin, make sure there's no unbelief so that God will punish you. It says, make sure there's no sin, there's no evil unbelief, because if there is, you'll miss out on what's available to you. And that's not God punishing you. God is not in the punishing business. God is in the loving and blessing business. So if we want to be partakers, if we want what's available to us, it's not about worrying about God's, if God's going to punish us. It's simply believing that what he did was enough to finish the work. If we want to live in the kingdom, it's not about God's going to kick me out if I don't believe. It's about if I don't believe, what's available to me is, is not going to be something that I'm going to be able to partake of. So again, it's not about you know God being mad at, mad at us if we sin. It's about if you're separated from the light, where are you? You're in darkness. That's not punishment. That's, that's common sense. If there's light and dark and you're not in the light, then you're in the dark. But that again, that's not punishment. And again, the way that we overcome that darkness is just by shining the light. The light makes the darkness flee. The light shows us what to believe in and, and empowers us to believe it. So it goes on and says, For as long as it's still God's today, keep each other on your toes so sin doesn't slow down your reflexes. If we can only keep our grip on the sure thing we started out with, we're in this with Christ for the long haul. If we can only stay where we started, if we can only come with faith like a child, if we can stop trying to figure this thing out so that we put God in a box and we say, all right, God, I got you now. If we can stop looking at it that way and say, listen, God got me and that's enough. I don't need to get him. He got me. I don't need to figure him out. I just need to believe. I just need to take God at his word and say, you know what? If, if, if you want to love me, then love me. And if it has nothing to do with me, all the better. Because then I can stop trying so hard to earn what he's freely given me. So it goes on and says, These words keep ringing in our ears. Today, please listen. Don't turn a deaf ear as in the bitter uprising. For who were the people who turned a deaf ear? Weren't they the very ones Moses led out of Egypt? And who was God provoked with for 40 years? Wasn't it those who turned a deaf ear and ended up corpses in the wilderness? And when he swore that they'd never get where they were going, wasn't he talking to the ones who turned a deaf ear? They never got there because they never listened, never believed. You have to hear it and you have to believe it. Faith comes from hearing and hearing comes from the word of God. Faith comes from having something faithful show up in your life 
Believing comes from having something that you can believe in. And that's who Jesus is. Jesus proved himself faithful. Jesus said, I love you, and here's how I'm going to prove it to you. The greatest love you can have is to lay down your life for a friend. That's what Jesus said. And then he said, watch this, I love you so much that I'm going to lay my life down for you. I'm going to do everything that you can't do on your own in order to give you everything that it's God's heart to give you. Which it says in another place in Scripture, it says uh, that it's, uh, what does it say? It's God's good pleasure to give his children the kingdom. But see, again, what was the problem? We didn't want the kingdom. We didn't want to get into the promised land. We wanted to go back to Egypt. We wanted to murmur and complain. All these things that natural Egypt, natural Israel showed us, That's what that was, was what was in our hearts. So God said, you know what? If your heart doesn't want to come in, but I want you to come in, I'll just give you my heart. I'll just do all the work for you, and I'll just let you enjoy everything good. That's how much God loves us. He loves you so much that he would literally rather die than be without you. And then he died so that he wouldn't have to be without you. Because again, we have to stop this focus where we think it's all about me getting to God. Because really, on my own, I don't want to get to God. But God draws me to himself because he wants me. God draws me to himself because his heart of love cannot continue unless I'm with him. And that's why Jesus finished the work. That's why he brought the kingdom here. He said, listen, you guys think you're trying really hard to get to heaven, but that's not what I want. Because that's not really what you want. What you want is everything that comes along with what you think success is regarding keeping the law. You want the best seat in the synagogue. You want, you know, the the best clothes. You want, you know, what you think of as the best life. You don't really want the kingdom because I'm the kingdom and you're rejecting me. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to give you the kingdom and then, and then I'm going to make it available. And once it's available, once you see something better, once you see a more excellent way, once you understand that there is something different to believe in, then if you want it, you can have it. And that's what he did. That's what he made available to us was, was literally himself, the king, the kingdom, grace land, promised land, rest, all of these different terms we use. It all amounts in what he did was he gave us himself. He gave his life for us, and he gave his life to us. And our only part in this is believing that so that he can live his life through us. If we believe he, he lives in us, then he will literally start to live through us. And, and that's the key. That's what we're talking about. That's how we, quote-unquote, finish the work that's already finished. So, continuing on in Hebrews chapter 4, I'm just going to start right with verse 1 and read down a little bit. In the King James it says, let us therefore fear, lest a, uh, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. This is the the this is what we should be, if we're concerned with anything in this life, this is what we should be concerned with. We should be concerned with missing out what we've been given. We should be concerned with not entering into this rest or of coming short of the gift of eternal life. And the reason that, again, the reason that we should be concerned with that, the reason that we should fear that, is not because God's going to be mad at us if we miss out on it, but guys, if I missed out on it, I would be mad at me. I would be mad at myself and I would say, what were you doing this whole time when you could have just been enjoying life? What were you doing, that, what were you believing in that was so important that God could not uh, take over that belief? If, 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 if you were looking at something else and you're thinking, this is better than God, you're going to kick yourself at the end of the day when you spent so much time and effort on something that really didn't mean anything. That's the only thing that we really need to be concerned about if we need to be concerned about anything. And, and if, if, if instead, if we stop even, even with this kind of negative view of things and we stop saying, you know what, I, I'm, I'm afraid of missing it. If we stop with that mindset and we say, I'm going to fill myself with it so much there's no chance I can miss it, then I think, again, that's a more excellent way. It's not about being afraid of anything, but it's about filling yourself with the good things that is Jesus. That's why the Bible says, taste and see that the Lord is good. Because when we taste Him, when we see, when we experience His goodness, that's going to show us that there's nothing else that compares to Him. That's going to show us that the world pales in comparison to the kingdom. And again, if you want the world, you can have it. But, I don't, you know, that's... You don't. You don't want the world. When you taste and see that the Lord is good, it's obvious which one is better. So it says in verse 2, For unto us was the gospel preached, as well as unto them. 
but the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. The only time the gospel is not going to be profitable to somebody is if they don't mix it with faith. The only time Jesus is not going to be able to help you is if you believe he can't help you. All of this works on faith. That's why we looked at even a couple of weeks ago, we are saved by grace through faith. Grace opens the door, but faith is what allows us to walk through the open door. Grace makes the kingdom available, but faith is what brings us into it. So again, the only way that you can miss out on any of the good stuff that God has for you is if you don't believe it. So it goes on in verse 3 and it says, For we which have believed do enter into rest. Period. That's it. You believe, you enter into rest. It's that simple. And again, I'm not saying it's that easy, but it's that simple. And, and really, when you understand what it is that you're believing in, then it gets to be that easy because he's so good that there, the only thing that makes sense is to believe in him. The only thing that makes sense is that a love this great is free. If it's not free, it's not love. And if it's not love, it's not God. So if you're trying to earn something from God, you're never going to be able to. But if you're believing that he already gave it to you, then you already have it. And that's where we stand today. The work is finished. The kingdom is here. So it goes on in verse 3. It says, For we which have believed do enter into rest. As he said, As I have sworn in my wrath, that they shall enter into my rest. Although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. Jesus really finished this thing on the cross. But, but, but in the eternal sense of God, it was finished before anything. The work was finished really before the work started. See, what Jesus did is he came and he brought us into the finished work. When God created Adam, when he created man way back in the beginning, he put man in Eden, in a garden, in a finished work. But what he did was he built the garden first. Man didn't come first and need somewhere to be. The garden was finished, the work was finished, God had a place for us, and then he created us and put us in it. So see, what we see here again is there was never any chance that the work wasn't going to get finished. The work was already finished from the jump street. What Jesus did is he showed us how it got finished and he brought us into it by finishing it not only for us, but as us. And that's so key to understand because, listen, even, even, even if I believe Jesus finished the work, but I, don't, I, I believe, you know, I don't believe that I was in Christ when he did it, then I'm still going to feel like there's something I have to do in order to qualify for this finished work. But if I can see that Jesus finished it both for me and as me, that means that I have finished the work in Him. I have rest in Him. I don't need rest. I don't need to finish it. Everything is already done. I am complete in Him. But again, if I see it as He did it for me and, and, and maybe I'll get there someday, then I'm probably never going to get there. It's only by completely and totally identifying with who Jesus is and what He did that any of what He went through, that means I went through. And that's why the Bible says, if you suffer with him, you'll reign with him. It doesn't mean you have to suffer in, in your own life. It means you have to identify with his suffering. His suffering is what made all of the blessings available to us. So it's only through his suffering that we can get his blessings. If I want my own blessings, I can go through my own sufferings, but that does not compare to God. If I want to try to build my own kingdom, it's, not, it's going to be a pretty shabby kingdom. If I'm going to try to win the rat race, all I'm going to be is King Rat. And none of that is anywhere close to what Jesus has made available to us. So it goes on in verse 4 and it says, For he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise, and God did rest the seventh day from all his works. And in this place again, if they shall enter into my rest. So here we're equating rest with the Sabbath day, the seventh day, which again is, is Jesus. And, and it's funny because I was just talking to my, my buddy about this, and he asked me the question, is Friday still Friday if you have to work on Saturday? And of course, I, I immediately took it to a spiritual place, and I said, bro, just live every day like it's Friday. And then he said, uh, so, so with Jesus, every day is Friday? And I said, well, actually with Jesus, every day is Sunday, because it's the Sabbath day. And, and you know what? If you're working on Sunday, you, you know, how hard are you working and what are you working towards? 
you have to have a time to rest, even in the natural. You have to have a time where you just kind of recalibrate, where you sit back, where you just relax, and you stop letting the world get to you, and you, and you, and you realize that I'm, I might be in the world, but I'm not of the world. The world can't touch me. Darkness can't touch me. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. If God is for me, who can be against me? If I am the light of the world, how is darkness going to do anything to me except flee from me? If I am the kingdom, how is the world going to creep up on me? Because, because again, the kingdom is what's ever expanding. We are the ones who are contagious, not the world. We don't have to be afraid of anything. We don't have to be afraid of getting our hands dirty. All we have to do is understand who we are, believe that we are who we are, and believe that we are where we are, and everything else just flows naturally. So again, you know, I, I, I really understood what my buddy was saying because... On Friday, you're looking forward to that day off. You've worked all week, and you're ready to rest. But but in the kingdom, it, that's not how it is. In the kingdom, it's rest, rest, rest every single day, no matter what you're doing. If you're working in the natural, you're still resting in the spiritual. It's all about living in the kingdom, living in this rest, dwelling in God's love, abiding in Him as He abides in us. It, again, it's not about what you're doing. It's about who you are. Again, we're not human doings, we're human beings. We do things, but it comes out of who we be. So that's why it's so important that we understand who we be, which is, again, which is Jesus. So it says, uh, in verse 5, it says, And in this place again, if they shall, if they shall enter into my rest. So, so rest is not something, rest is something available, but it's not something that's forced on us. It's a choice that we make. If we want His rest, then we believe that we are in His rest. It's that simple. So it goes on and he says in verse 6, Seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of unbelief. Again, he limiteth a certain day, saying to David, Today, after so long a time, as it is said, today, if... Ye will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. For if Jesus had given them rest, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day. So basically, he, what, he, what he's saying here is, if, if the people of Israel had gotten true rest, even though you know, the first generation died and then the next generation Joshua led them into the promised land, that wasn't true rest, that was a type and shadow of what we're really talking about here. Because again, we're not talking about a promised land in, in the Middle East somewhere, we're talking about the promised land that is Jesus. So he's saying God showed us what it meant. Those who believed got into the, the natural promised land. But, but now on this side of the cross, what that means is by believing you get into the, the real, true, spiritual promised land of rest, which is Jesus. And he's saying if that promised land was good enough, we wouldn't still be talking about it. If the people of Israel's promised land was good enough, God wouldn't have spoken to David of another rest. It's the same idea with, with, with the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. If the Old Covenant was good enough, God wouldn't have made a New Covenant. If the Old Covenant could have done what it was supposed to do, we wouldn't have needed anything else. But, but obviously we did because the Old Covenant or the Law demands perfection without being able to produce it. It's only when Jesus came who, who is perfection, and it's only when Jesus, again, gave himself to us, put himself in us, that's where our perfection comes from. Now we're perfect not because of what we do, but we're perfect because the perfect one lives in us. And again, that's what rest is. It's not me living at all, it's Jesus living in me. It's not me trying at all, it's just me letting Jesus do whatever he wants to do in me and through me. That's what true rest is. And that's why it says uh, in verse 8, For if Jesus had given them rest, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day? There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. So, so again, he's just making it as clear as he can make it. We're not talking about the natural promised land. Because if that, if that was it, then what are we talking about here? We're not talking about you need to go to the Middle East, you need to go to Israel. We're not talking about any of that stuff. We're talking about not a rest that you go to, but a rest that's inside of you. So he says in verse 10, For he that is entered into his rest, he also hath ceased from his own work, as God did from His. That's why He brought up this Sabbath day rest. That's why He brought up God created the whole world in six days, and on the seventh day He stopped because the work was done. He says in the exact same way, we stop from our work 
when we realize that it is done. We stop trying so hard to finish what's already finished when we can see that it's finished, when we can see how it got finished. That's why I wrote the book, Six Steps to the Throne, not, not, not so that I could keep saying the work is finished, but so that we could see how it got finished. Because listen, going back to my, uh, back to my lawnmower story, if my wife sees me mow the lawn, she's not going to ask me if I mowed it. She saw how the work got finished. She saw how it got done. She knows that the, that the lawn is mowed, and then she doesn't need to question it. She doesn't need to doubt it. She's seen it. Because really, in, in, in so many ways, seeing is believing. God shows you something to believe in before he expects you to believe in it. He showed Moses a bush that was on fire but that wasn't burning. He showed Moses something impossible and said, now that I have your attention, now that you have something to believe, now that you believe that I am more powerful than this world, because in the world a bush can't burn without consuming itself. A bush can't burn and just stay burning forever. But God said, this is what I'm going to show you because it, simply because it doesn't make sense. I'm going to show you this so it'll stop you and you can say, wait a minute. If this bush is burning and it's not being consumed, that's not right. That's not natural. That's something higher. That's something different. And God said, now that you believe that I can do these things, now that Jesus can come and walk on water and he can say, listen, I am in charge of nature. Nature is not in charge of me. I am in charge of this world because I'm the king. This world does not get to dictate to us. God's word is the last, final, true word. If something in your life doesn't line up with Scripture, Scripture's not wrong. Whatever you're looking at is wrong. And when you can see it the way it says it in the Bible, when, when faith comes from hearing the word of God, then when you start mixing this engrafted word with faith, that's when things start to really become what they already are. That's when the light shines and you stop seeing things badly or, or, or wrongly, and you start seeing them through the eyes of the kingdom, through the, through the eyes of the Spirit. And, I, and, and on a Tuesday series we were preaching not too long ago, we saw the progression in the Song of Solomon where first we, we were described as having dove's eyes, which means being able to see in the Holy Spirit, and then we were described as literally being the dove. And that's what I'm talking about. When you see it, you will be it. When you start to see things in a kingdom realm, in a kingdom dimension, in a kingdom economy, then what's, what's true, what you can finally see, now it's becoming true for you. Now, now instead of seeing the kingdom somewhere else, you, you're starting to be the kingdom. And that's why Jesus told Nicodemus, he said, unless you're born again, you can't see the kingdom. And then he said, unless you're born of, of the spirit, you can't enter the kingdom. First we have to see it before we can be it, and that's really what faith is. God proves himself faithful, and then he says, have faith in me. God proves himself trustworthy, and then he says, trust in me. It doesn't work the other way, it can't. You're not going to just blindly start to follow something unless you see something worth following. That's the key here when it comes to faith. So, in verse 11, it says, Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. And I love this verse because it sounds like an oxymoron. It sounds like, hurry up and finish the work so you can get to rest. Labor really hard, get the work done, and then relax. But that's not what it's saying at all, because the word labor is number 4704 in Strong's Creek Concordance, and it means to use speed or be diligent. What the writer of Hebrews is saying here, he's like, hurry up and get in here, where you already are, by believing it. He's like, stop messing around with all this other stuff. Just believe that, you, that the kingdom is here and it's us, and then we, we, can, we can really start moving upward and Godward. He's not saying work really hard and finish the, the work so you can rest. He's saying believe the work's done. Hurry up and believe this is done. Be diligent and see how it got done. Put your faith where it belongs. Put your focus where it belongs. Stop looking at yourself and what you're doing and start looking at Jesus and what he did and then you'll be able to believe correctly and, and out of believing correctly, you'll be able to live correctly. This all comes from, again, it comes from the head leading the body. It comes from what you believe coming out through what you do. So I want to read this in the message and then we're going to read a couple of verses in Hebrew chapter 12. And then I'm going to close. Hebrews 4, starting with verse 1, in the Message Bible says, For as long then as that promise of resting in Him pulls us on to God's goal for us, we need to be careful that we're not disqualified. 
we received the same promises as those people in the wilderness. And I want to stop here and I want to make this clear. Every promise in the Bible about blessings or long life or, or whatever it may be, even the promises under the Old Covenant, even the promises under the law, they're still applicable to us because Jesus fulfilled that covenant. Jesus earned every single blessing the Old Covenant promised us. And then after he did that, he gave them to us freely by giving himself to us. So if you're reading, uh, I believe it's in Deuteronomy, and God promises a, a, a whole big list of blessings, and then he warns about a whole big list of, of curses, what you need to do is read the blessings and then stop. Because that's for you and the rest of it isn't. The only, the, listen, the gospel is good news. The gospel is not, if you misbehave, you'll be cursed. That was the old covenant, old uh, Mosaic law, old religious system, and that's not where we are anymore. That literally was the way of the world. If you do good, you'll get good. If you do bad, you'll get bad. But we're not in the world, we're in the kingdom. And the kingdom is, it's God's good pleasure to give it to you. The kingdom is, God loves you, and, and everything that's good, that is Him, that comes from Him, is freely given to us. So that's what it says. Uh, we received the same promises as those people in the wilderness. But the promises didn't do them a bit of good because they didn't receive the promises with faith. How do we receive the promises? Through faith. We believe that God promised it to us, and, and then we believe on the cross that God kept his promise. We believe that everything is fulfilled in the person of Jesus. If you need anything, and you're looking for it somewhere other than Jesus, you're not going to find it. He is the answer to every problem. He is the solution. He is the way, the truth, and the life. Outside of him, there's nothing that we need. And in him is everything that we need. But again, it comes from believing. So it says, if we believe, though, we'll experience that state of resting. But not if we don't have faith. Remember what God said. Exasperated, I vowed, they'll never get where they're going. Never be able to sit down and rest. This is the law. This is religion. This is the old covenant. Uh, when, when the rich young ruler came to Jesus and he said, what do I have to do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus gave them a whole big long list of laws to follow because at that time, that's the economy they were under. And the ruler said, I've done all of these things. And Jesus said, but one thing you lack. And that's how it is in religion. There's always one thing that you lack. There's always a carrot on a stick that's moving just a little bit farther ahead of you just to keep leading you on, just to keep making you behave a certain way, just to keep other people in control so that they can tell you how you're supposed to be. That's how it was but that's not how it is. Jesus came and he took the carrot off the stick and he said, get yourself a butt. He said, listen, I am the fulfillment of everything that was in the law. You couldn't keep it, so I kept it for you. But again, I didn't just keep it for you, I kept it as you. I wrapped you up in myself and I said, what I'm doing, that's what you're doing. So again, only through faith are, is, is Jesus' obedience accredited to us for righteousness. So then, going on with verse 3, it says, God made that vow, even though he'd finished his part before the foundation of the world. So again, God had made the way of grace, even back then, even to those people, even in the natural promised land. He said, here's what I'm going to give you, here's what I have available. You want to try to get to me, but that's not the point, I'm going to come to you. He made, he did his part, God has, and again, if he did it before the foundation of the world, we don't need to wait for God to do something. We don't need to, quote-unquote, wait for God's timing. God's timing culminated on the cross, and everything that he promised, he's given to us. Every healing, every, you know, everything, every blessing, every, every uh, abundant life God's promised to us was given to us on the cross. We don't have to wait for anything. It's all readily available. All we have to do is believe it. I don't need God to heal me. I need to believe that he healed me 2,000 years ago. That's the key. That's the mindset shift. That's what faith is. It's not believing God will do something. It's believing that he already did something. We finish the work by believing that it's finished. So that's what it says. He says, uh, God made that vow even though he'd finished his part before the foundation of the world. Somewhere it's written, God rested the seventh day having completed his work. But in this other text, he says, they'll never be able to sit down and rest. So this promise has not yet been fulfilled, which again, we're talking about things that were said before the cross. God finished his work, but God was at rest, but the people weren't 
because the cross hadn't happened, because Jesus hadn't happened, because we didn't know how the work got finished, so we were trying to finish it ourselves. So it says, uh, so uh, those earlier ones never did get to the place of rest because they were disobedient. And again, how were they disobedient? Because they didn't believe. It's not about your actions, it's about what you believe. Had they believed, they wouldn't have acted disobediently. So it all flows down from what you believe. It says, God keeps renewing the promise and setting the date as today. And that's why we have verses like, now faith is. Our God is a now God. He's not in the future, he's in the present because of what he did 2,000 years ago in the past. Every single day is the day of salvation. If you believe it, if you enter into it, if you grab hold of who Jesus is and what he did. So, it says, God keeps renewing the promise and setting the date as today, just as he did in David's psalm, centuries later than the original invitation. Today, please listen, don't turn a deaf ear. So, this is still a live promise. It wasn't canceled at the time of Joshua. So, so again, when, when Joshua led the people into the physical promised land, that doesn't mean if you're not in that physical promised land, you, you're, you're out of the deal. What it means is that was a type and shadow of a much bigger promise. It says, God wouldn't keep renewing the appointment for today. The promise of arrival and rest is still there for God's people. God himself is at rest. And at the end of the journey, we'll surely rest with God. So let's keep at it and eventually arrive at the place of rest, not drop out through some sort of disobedience. Which again, you know, in the Message Bible, he, he, the writer of it, he still always puts things like we're going to get there someday. But, but the principle is, as soon as you believe it, you're in it. So if you don't feel like you're in it right now, you are. But, but in order to be where you are, you have to believe it. There, there, there's, there's, there can still be separation in your mind. If, if you're not believing, right? There's really no separation. Jesus came and got rid of it. But in your own mind, you know, uh, I've really been stuck on a, a, another scripture where it talks about how once we were alienated and we were enemies in our minds through our wicked works. And what that means is we would do something wrong and we would think God was mad at us. We would think we were enemies with him in our minds. But again, that's why it's so important that Jesus gave us his mind. Because his mind knows no man after the flesh. His mind is spirit to spirit. His mind is all about who you really are, not who you think you are, and not what you do because of who you think you are. God is all about who you really are, and he's all about revealing to you who you really are. He's all about giving you something to believe in rather than just demanding, you know what, you better believe in this or else. He says, no, 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 here's something better, believe in this. He's saying, I'm going to get rid of the tree of death, so, so really your only option will be to eat from the tree of life. I'm going to show you a more excellent way in order for you to understand that you, that to understand that that more excellent way, Jesus, lives in you. You don't need anything, you've already been given everything. So let's turn to Hebrews 12, and then we'll read this real quick and we'll close. Hebrews 12, verses 24 through 28, in the King James it reads like this. And to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel, see that ye refuse not him that speaketh. Again, he's saying, don't harden your heart. He's saying, hear this. He's saying, get this. He's saying, this is what will produce faith in you, hearing about Jesus. See that, ref you re see that ye refuse not him that speaketh. For they if they escaped not who refused him that spake on earth, much more shall not we escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven, whose voice then shook the earth. This happened again on the cross. There was an earthquake. It went dark. Everything the Bible talks about is about the cross. He's saying, whose voice then shook the earth, but now he hath promised, saying, yet once more I shake not the earth only, but also heaven. And this word, yet once more signifieth the removing of those things that were shaken. That's why the earth shook, because some, of, some stuff had to go. That's why Adam was crucified too, because the old man had to go. God doesn't shake things up in order to see if you can take the shaking. He shakes things up to put them in divine order. Sometimes we need to be shaken so we can say, wait a minute, what am I focusing on? What am I caring about? What am I believing in when I really 
know the truth? Why can't I just believe in God? And, and, and I know it's hard because there's so many distractions, but that's what the shaking is talking about. Because he says, uh, things that are, he says, yet yeah, once more I shake not the earth only, but also heaven. Heaven is your mind, and earth is your body. So he doesn't just shake the earth, he doesn't just shake you up, he shakes up your mind and he says, wait a minute, hold on, what are we thinking about? What are we believing in? What are we doing here? What are we talking about? The only thing that we ever need to believe in is Jesus. But all these other thoughts creep in and sometimes, you know, you got to shake them out. you got to lay aside the sin that so easily besets you. you got to recalibrate, you got to say, wait a minute, hold on. My focus needs to be on things above and not things beneath. My things need to be on heaven and not on earth. That's how... That's why Jesus prayed on earth as it is in heaven. It all starts at the head, then goes to the body. It starts what you believe and then what you do. The old covenant was all about shaking the earth and making you behave the right way. The new covenant is about shaking the heaven and giving you the right mindset, giving you repentance, giving you the mind of Christ. And then it says in verse 27, And this word, yet once more, signifieth the removing of those things that are shaken, as of things that are made, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. What can't be shaken? The rock. Jesus. The rock remains. If your house is built on the rock, it can't be shaken. If your focus is on Him, you're going to be okay no matter what. If you know the work is finished, you're not going to keep trying to finish it. If you're believing right, everything else will flow. And then in verse 28 it says, Wherefore, we, receiving a kingdom, remember, that's what the finished work did, it established the kingdom. Wherefore, we, receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace, whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. The kingdom is what can't be shaken. Which means if you're the kingdom, you can't be shaken. Which means no matter what's going on around you, you will be the anchor in that place. You will be the lighthouse that repels the darkness. You will be everything that Jesus says you are. And that's what it says here, whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. See, it's not about the work's finished, that means I don't have to do anything. It, it's all about the work is finished, and now I can do all of the things that I was created to do. Now I can receive God's love and release it. Now I can be so full of God's love that it flows out of me naturally. Now all the good things that I thought I needed to do or else, now all of those good things, now they just flow out of me because there's good things in me. What's in you is what comes out of you. And then it says in verse 29, For our God is a consuming fire. And again, what He consumes is everything that's not Him. The bush was that we, that we referenced with Moses, it was burning, but, but it was God, so there was nothing that, that, that would be consumed. There was nothing that would be burned up. It was only God feeding on Himself. It was only love feeding on itself. God doesn't consume Himself. He consumes everything else. He swallows up death in life. He swallows up fear in love. He brought something better for us in the person of Jesus. He swallowed up work in rest. He said, listen guys, I'm going to do it all. I'm going to pay it all. I'm going to give it all. And then you're going to be able to live it all. And again, how that happens is not us trying to live Jesus' life, because again, that's a lot of work. It's a lot of work to try to follow in Jesus' footsteps. And I've learned real quick that I cannot do it. But what rest is, I'm not trying to follow in Jesus' footsteps. I'm letting Jesus make new footsteps in my feet. I'm letting Jesus live his life in me, and then I don't have to do anything but enjoy the ride. I'm owned and operated by Jesus. He takes care of me when I break down. He, he, you know, he fills me up with the gas or the love that I need, and he drives me where he wants me to go. That's what true life is. It's not about us trying to figure out anything, but just about us being in relationship with God. That's why God created us, because He wanted somebody to be able to pour Himself or His love into. The most important thing we will ever figure out in this life is why we're here. And why we're here is because God wanted to love us. Period. And that's, what, that's the work that was finished. He brought us to a place where we are in the kingdom and we can receive His love. And, and again, you know, the way that we finish the work, which, which we don't really finish it at all, but... but the way we wrap our minds around the finished work is by believing it, by seeing it and believing it, by letting Him shake out anything that needs to be shaken out, by letting Him consume anything in us that's not Him. 
and, and just by letting him love us. And that's that's what the finished work is. Amen. Okay.